The Wholeness Network. Awaken to the reality of wholeness. In this episode, best-selling author William Paul Young shares his unparalleled wisdom and wit behind the making of his most famous book, The Shack. I heard him in an interview back in November and was so intrigued, I listened to it three times in one day. I reached out, the stars aligned, and long story short, we now call him Friend. Everybody wants to know the story, you're like, no, you've told it a thousand times, but the, how the shack came to be. Just give us a And I love telling it. I mean, it's... It's so unexpected. Yeah. Um, I never uh, wanted to be a published author. It wasn't on the bucket list. Mm-hmm. It wasn't on any of that. And um, But I grew up on the other side of the planet. I grew up in the highlands of New Guinea, and we didn't have a lot of technology. <laughs> and so the only way I could get out of my world, um, which had a lot of sadness to it, mm-hmm. as well as incredible wonder Mm -hmm. Uh, but the only way to really get out of my world was reading Mm -hmm. and so I learned to write by reading Mm -hmm. and um, and then as I got a little older I would write I I was talking to someone that I was in boarding school with Mm -hmm. and they were talking about how I was always writing I don't remember that but um, writing became a way to get my inside world out Mm -hmm. uh, and reading to get out of my world Mm -hmm. and so over the years, uh, a lot of my writing was pretty dark. Um, I think I think nightmares sometimes are a way to try to get mm-hmm. the garbage from the inside out. Mm-hmm. And um, um, and so a lot of my early stuff was pretty pretty harsh, and I'd burn it anyway because I couldn't take the risk my dad might find it. Mm-hmm. But slowly over time, I started to write poetry and short stories and songs, and I'd give them to friends and family because. A way to tell people that you love them and you care mm-hmm. about them, and um, and they like them, but they're my friends and family. <laughs> so <laughs> so Kim liked my my writing. Yeah. And I was uh, I was about forty six, I think, when she started saying, you know, someday as a gift for our children, would you just write something that puts in one place how you think because you think outside the box. And I but I didn't feel healthy enough to do that. Mm-hmm. And until the year I turned 50 and um, and suddenly it's like oh right I've got 40 minutes each way to one of my three jobs and and um, I could uh, I could do this I had nothing else to give the kids for Christmas mm-hmm. so I could write whatever this is Kim's been wanting me to write and I started with here's funny I'm writing on the train and um, I think I'm writing these conversations just asking my questions because I've always been a question asker yeah. and and they're living these conversations I'm finding out these are really cool you know so I was writing on the backs of grocery bags I mean it was happening like all the wow. time so I'm writing uh, this in the train and then I think I could give this to the kids and call it conversations with God and I look up and there's a marquee on a movie theater that says conversations with God and I go Somebody already took it. <laughs> yeah. I'd never heard of it at that point. So it was like, but then, you know, I wanted to put it into story. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, I, and what I'm basically doing is saying, uh, I want to write something for my kids that expresses to the, them the things that matter to me. I don't want them growing up with the God that I grew up with, for example. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so it was like oh, story, story, because every human being is a story, mm-hmm. and uh, we have an affinity with story, and story slips past our watchful dragons, mm-hmm. and um, so I thought, yeah. so who's writing this? Uh, who's having these conversations? And that's where Mackenzie came. Mm-hmm. But in the course of of working on the story, and it just bloomed because I was working three jobs, you know, yeah. I'd never taken a class or whatever. I'm just trying to get it done wow. for Christmas, and. Um, and it just flowed. It was like jumping in a river. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the symbolism was there yeah, from the beginning, yeah. and the character of God was there from the beginning. And um, so it was. It was. Uh, 
and a lot of people don't realize that I'm both Mackenzie and Missy, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, b- both names, by the way, are Mackenzie Allen Phillips, which spells map, mm-hmm. but Melissa Ann Phillips also spells map. Mm-hmm. And um, a writer from Nashville said, you know, when she read the book first, she said, I don't know who you are, but my sense is that Missy represents something murdered in you as a child, probably your innocence. Mm-hmm. And Mackenzie is usually the adult trying to deal with it. Mm-hmm. So I get it done for Christmas and make my 15 copies at Office Depot. And six went to the kids, copy to Kim, copy for me, just to keep yeah. gave the extras to my friends and went back to work. Never, it had never crossed my mind one time to publish this thing. Wow. And, um, and it, those 15 copies did everything I ever wanted that book to do. Yeah, you right. Mm-hmm. You, uh, your kids, you know, it takes them a while. It's like, a book, really. <laughs> we'll get right on that. Thanks, you know? Dad. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Dad. <laughs> so it took them a while. And, and just as an aside, too, uh, a few years later when, it, when we put it into print, Yeah. Kim says, you know, when I asked you to do this, I was thinking like four to six pages. Oh. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm surrounded by people who love me but aren't depressed. <laughs> it's I a know. great thing. It's I a great know. thing. You know, so. So, um, when you, I think it's just amazing that you were able to think about story because in story, then I can draw my own, I can relate differently. A where it's good just, story, yeah, story opens up more space yeah. than it uses. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, C.S. Lewis had the idea that the inside is bigger than the outside. Yeah, and good story does that. Yeah. Um, I come from a, a modern evangelical Christian fundamentalism. That's where I grew up, and uh, and and they they lost the art of telling story, mm-hmm. and they would turn it into propaganda. Mm-hmm. And as mm-hmm. soon as you as soon as you put an agenda in it, yeah. and are trying to say you need to think and hear what I hear. Yeah. As soon as you do that, you've turned it into propaganda and you lose the art. You lose and I, I there was a book I read that I connected with about myth. Connecting mm-hmm. you know, myth is actually the most beautiful thing to to try and make it an, an exact story. It'll never it'll never be that way. Yeah. And I recognize that even you know, even a movie when you, you can watch the trailer and get an idea but it's nothing near the movie, and the yeah. movie's nothing near the book. Yeah, you and know? and good story intersects you at a place where you're at, and nobody yes. else is at. Right. So if you ask 20 people what they got out of the right. shack, you're going to hear different things, and you're going to hear them say, "Well, then I read it, read it a year later, and I didn't even see that." Yeah. You know. Yes. Because their life had journeyed into the story. Right. And now they get to meet it at a different spot. Right. So, so there's that, a really beautiful dynamic in yeah in storytelling. It came at a good time to, to put it into story. Came. I think that was the most perfect way to bring it. Timing is the sandbox of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all I think. You know, it's like, yeah. you know. I had no clue what I was doing yeah. and what the ripple effect of it would mm-hmm. be. None at all. Right. And um, like I said, 15 copies did everything I ever wanted yeah. that to do. All this is God's sense of humor. Yeah. You know? All right. I like to tell people it's proof that God can still speak through Balaam's ass. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Old Testament for anybody else. I'm just being sacrilegious here. I love it. I love it. So, funny. Um, so you, I've heard you say before that Kim wanted to know, she wanted you to get on paper how you think. Yes. What is that? That's why she thought four to six pages would be <laughs> sufficient. <laughs> so, yeah, what did she see you need? Would you well, talk because, it right? Or how well, did she know what you thought? Because... I had been vocal over my lifetime, and and you know, and and my struggles with religion had been mm-hmm. not hidden, mm-hmm. um, but I was trying to approach it in a way that was still kind. Yeah. You know, um, I had enough chips on my shoulders as it was. Yeah. Um, so as I would teach things, or as I would communicate things over the course of years, and I'd been silent before I wrote the book. I'd been silent for about thirteen years. Mm-hmm. I hit a I hit a wall and decided, like, I'm done talking. I'm, yeah. You know what? Um, I really have no clue. Mm-hmm. And um, so as I had begun to, to talk again, and it, and it connected with things that I could see, mm-hmm. even when I was so damaged I didn't know how to live it, I could still mm-hmm. see things, mm-hmm. right? And um, so over the course of those years, it was like, you know, 
just put it down somewhere so that our kids mm -hmm. can see this story because it's bigger it's bigger than the text mm -hmm. right and um, and it turns out that I'm a good communicator. So, yeah. so <laughs> I know. Surprise, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who'd have thought? That's that's funny. <laughs> you know, my mom passed away New Year's Eve day last year. Oh, right. Sorry. Um, so a year ago. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And she was 90 years old. And I'm certain that the last thing she said to me. You know, we were in her room, and she kind of looks at me funny, like moms do. And I go, what, mom, what? She goes, you're my son. Who would have thought? <laughs> and I'm going like, you're exactly right. Oh, Who would have yeah. thought, you know? Uh -huh. but, but I've always grappled with, with big picture right. questions, you know? Mm -hmm. Who's God? Why are we believing this? It doesn't make any sense. Why do we treat women this way? That doesn't make any yeah. sense, you know? And so when it did, I come from another culture. Right. So I, I had the advantage in a sense. Yeah. Uh, the disadvantage is I couldn't find anywhere to belong. Mm -hmm. But the advantage was I could see from outside the culture. The problem was I was damaged. And so that became a place of power, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, And I'm not a big guy, but... I, I could hide knives inside words. Mm -hmm. And if I can see the inconsistencies in your world because I'm from outside of it, yeah. that becomes, you can weaponize that, yeah. you know? And, and if you do it nicely, they don't, they know they're bleeding, but they don't know who quite cut them. My question goes back to your childhood because you're obviously such a tender-hearted person. How mm -hmm. did you, what were your coping mechanisms? How did you survive all that trauma and hardship as a child, yeah. what did you do? I think everyone is born tender-hearted, mm -hmm. and um, children by nature trust until someone teaches them that it's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. So if you take the combination of my dad, who had no no capacity or chip for being a dad, you know, mm -hmm. his dad had busted that before I ever showed up, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just knew that he was a mean and furious man, mm -hmm. and um, very he was a violent disciplinarian, and I was mm -hmm. the firstborn. Mm -hmm. Child, I was a year old when we went into the mm -hmm. the Highlands in New Guinea, and um, and so I did not bond to him at all. I, yeah. You know, he was he was terrifying to me, um, and so I had night terrors growing up. Mm -hmm. Not just because of him, but yeah. sexual abuse started in the culture before I was five, and there was a lot of that. So yeah. whatever fragility and tenderness, it. it it had the hell beat out of it by the yeah. time I went to boarding school. Wow. So at six, I was sent away to boarding school. And the, the first nights, the big boys would come and molest the little boys. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what were your coping survival skills? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All the standard ones. Hypervigilance, um, becoming a really good liar. I think mm -hmm. that's partly why I'm a good storyteller. I, I said <laughs> earlier that good liars make good storytellers. And... Um, um, uh, to use the imagery of the shack, the shack becomes the, the broken house on the inside, mm -hmm, yeah. right? For some people who grew up well, affirmed, encouraged, they don't have a house of shame on the inside, but I think the majority of people do. I think so, yeah. And, um, and so uh, people help you build that house, and for a lot of us, we didn't get good help. So that's where we store our addictions. That's where we hide our secrets. That's where we never want anybody to... Uh, find their way in because we're terrified that we'll see the same look of disgust on their face that we feel for ourselves. Yes. And um, so coping mechanism, you take a few timbers from your shack, uh, drag them a hundred yards out and build a facade. You know, mm -hmm. like in the movies, it looks like a right. building, but it's not a building. Right. The thing about a facade is that you can paint it as fast as you can pick up people's expectations. Mm -hmm. So some of the survival skills of hypervigilance, um, uh, not having any boundaries, but so you survive by picking up the boundaries of those around you. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a coping mechanism. Um, and uh, so you're constantly reading the audience, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And when you constantly read the audience, then you can adjust to try to perform your way into some sense of approval and affection. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> the, the danger of that is that you totally get caught by secrets. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a two-edged sword, both which cut you. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, 
I can't tell you my secrets mm -hmm. because I'm terrified you'll see the you know you'll see the truth about who I am yeah. and be di as disgusted as I am mm -hmm. um, and I need at the same time I'm trying to be um, strong and disassociated and and live in my head right. you know disassociated as a yeah. survival skill you become an yeah. intellectual you know and um, and mm -hmm. hide inside words and um, and so uh, I can't tell you my secrets but I still need those little bits of light mm -hmm. you know some kindness mm -hmm. some approval some affection so mm -hmm. I uh, so I'm working so hard to win affection and approval but when I get it I don't believe it and here's why because you don't know the secrets mm -hmm. I have yeah. fooled you right. and I remember graduating my undergraduate degree Phi Beta Kappa Summa Cum Laude the whole thing and walking out with the thought I fooled them wow. you know because nothing is true and good from the inside out yeah. that has already been so obliterated you can only live from the outside in so at what point did you start turning that around? What, mm -hmm. When did you begin your healing journey? Well, I, I, think, I think I was pursued my entire life. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that is the commitment of God who loves us to us. And that is that I'm pursuing you from day one, mm -hmm. you know, inside the tragedy and the losses. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I can look back and say, here were milestones where things shifted, mm -hmm. but because um, but, uh, because things would catch you sideways, mm -hmm. you know. I, my safest place in my life as a child was in a rainstorm. Mm -hmm. And the reason was is because the first the first real house we had, because uh, at first we had a little shack, mm -hmm. and the whole wall had to come down during the day so that the tribal people could see everything. Wow. Because if if you closed up and you were in there, they would begin to think you were creating some kind of black magic, and they'd have burned us alive. Wow. And, uh, oh and so, um, and we were under the constant threat. Now I was unaware of it because right. I grew up Donnie. I grew up tribal. My right. parents were doing the mission. Uh -huh. My mother was a nurse. She was doing the medical side. This is a tribe that had never seen a white person. Nobody knew their language. Wow. At five, I was the informant when Wycliffe came in to translate. Right. Right, but I was also around the conversations where the Donnie were trying to figure out whether to kill my parents or not. Oh wow! Right, as a, and so I I didn't even know I was white till I went to boarding school. I mean, <laughs> it was it was not a conscious awareness. Right, you know, and um, so uh, the first real house we had um, when we finally had an airstrip, we built an airstrip, and they flew in um, sheets of of uh, aluminum. So we built an aluminum house, aluminum walls, aluminum roof. And this is in the tropics, at the highlands between um, the coast near the equator and glaciers in the beginning. And when the monsoons would hit, it would be so loud. I could be this far from you, and I could scream, and you couldn't hear me. Wow. So oh I couldn't hear my dad. I couldn't hear him coming. Yeah. I, couldn't, I, he could, I couldn't say anything wrong. Right. And so even now, if I'm in a really strong rainstorm in a car or something it's just like I get electric you know oh. so isn't that a isn't that a whisper that says I'm I'm here you know yeah. but even as a child so um, but you know mm -hmm. I, I, I built the facade pretty well turns out that I am creative and I am <laughs> smart which only empowered my ability to hide <laughs> you know, it probably drug it out you know 20 years beyond what it should have yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and I, one of my survival mechanisms was to leave. Mm -hmm. You know, of course I justified it because I'm a good liar, especially mm -hmm. to myself. And I'd go like, oh, I think I hear God call me somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a thin layer of perfectionist performance yeah. covered up, covering up an ocean of yeah. shame. And then people start poking down through once they start to get to know you mm -hmm. and not just the facade. And that's when you hear God call you somewhere else, you know. Yeah. And then, so I'd, I'd moved all my life anyway. 13 schools before I graduated high school. Oh so the, the big cataclysmic hit the bottom event was in 94. And uh, I was 38, married to Kim. We had our sixth child, Matthew had been born. And January 4th, 1994, um, I got a one sentence phone call from Kim. And it was, I'm waiting at your office and I know. 
Mm-hmm. And what she knew was I was in a three month affair with one of her best friends. Mm-hmm. And at that point it was either kill myself, which is almost hitting the bottom, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Not quite, mm-hmm. or hitting the bottom mm-hmm. and facing it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's when everything began to unravel and dismantle. Mm-hmm. And that started an 11 year journey. Mm-hmm. Um, it took him and I 11 years to heal mm-hmm. and 11 years to do the work, mm-hmm. including some intense therapy, mm-hmm. including letting people into my world, including becoming a truth teller, mm-hmm. you know, forgiving. I mean, so many components to that journey. And you have to get over the trauma of the past to be able to do that. You can't just yeah. sway. Right. You, you, and, it, and it's not getting over the trauma of the path past in the sense that it is now gone. Right. It right. is it is working the his, our history the way that it truly is mm-hmm. and realizing that it's become part of the sound that we are now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And uh, so it's not extricating yeah. the past. And even though I don't know who says it, but the weight doesn't drive the boat. Yeah. The weight does drive the boat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is a power in what is behind us that yeah. has to be addressed. And, right. And people, you know, my my people are so good about like, oh, the old is gone, the new has come, all things are passed away, all things have become new. And because they don't want to deal with the junk. Yeah. And as a result, they don't do any work on the inside either. Right. Yeah. Because the inside is where we carry all that history. Right. And and if you don't do the work, you're stuck mm-hmm. and you're gonna stay stuck. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, but thankfully God is a redeeming genius and 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 will find a way into that darkness to help you begin to build in a direction that's forward. But you gotta deal with history. Yeah. yeah. And that's what we love about wholeness, is it yeah. I mean it, it is part of your wholeness. Yeah. It's not something to be to cut off and leave behind. It, yeah. it's part of it's part of what made you who you and, are. You know, and it's hard work. Yeah. But it's it's worthy work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and it's it's so embarrassing, um, but but it's not shaming. Mm-hmm. You know, and you gotta you gotta learn to turn your face into it and deal with it mm-hmm. in the face of the person that's in front of you. Yeah. So we never made my adultery the new secret, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. When I when I drove across town and into the office that I that I owned at the time, business office, and Kim had already torn it apart because that's she's the force. She and her five sisters are called the force, and uh, they're they're Minnesota North Dakota girls. And there's no Fifty Shades of Grey in Minnesota North Dakota, and uh, so Kim had torn the place apart, and um, and she lights into me with all this fury. And after about four hours, I said, okay. Kim, if we're going to do this, I need to tell you every secret I have because secrets have been killing me my whole life. Yeah. And naively, she said, bring it on. And it took me four days to tell her everything she didn't know. Mm-hmm. And um, and it destroyed her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she said, I'll never believe another word that comes out of your mouth the rest of your life. But as furious as she was, she believed I'd hit the bottom. And I had. Yeah. And, and part of it was day by day I dealt with the fury. Uh, her dad lived with us for 17 years and was living with us at this time. Oh dear. <laughs> and, um, and her family is huge. She has five sisters and two brothers and they all had large families and she was the favorite aunt. And and, and step by step, you know, mm-hmm. the two oldest of our kids went through it with us and then over the years I had to tell the others. Mm-hmm. The community knew it. We didn't, like I said, it, done with secrets. Mm-hmm. And that, that became a place I could stand, mm-hmm. like done with secrets, yeah. you know, but uh, but that meant there were no mm-hmm. no guarantees and no control. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. it's just like I couldn't I couldn't heal Kim. I couldn't even heal myself. So right. you know, yeah. the audacity to think that I could heal anybody else, yeah. Yeah. and um, and just like all right, so I'm the one that pulled the yellow pages off the shelf. And opened it up under counselors and started with the A's and worked my way down until I ran into agape, which is yeah. the word for love. You know, God is oh. agape. Agape Youth and Family Services specializing in sexual abuse histories. Wow. And I called total strangers and walked into their office and mm. sat in front of Scott Mitchell and said, my life is over. And he said, well, 
what do you want? Mm -hmm. And I said, I really don't need someone to ask me how I'm feeling about this. Yeah. I need to know, can you get me from A to Z? Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, I can. It'll take a year and a half. I said, I'm in. He said, everybody says they're in <laughs> when they're sitting where you are. Right. But, you know, in a couple months, you'll feel better about yourself and you'll, yeah. you'll uh, feel more in control and you'll bail out right mm -hmm. before the really hard stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I hit the bottom. And when you hit the bottom, you're not pointing fingers anywhere. You're going like, I don't think I'm smarter than anybody. And I told him, I am not leaving until you tell me I'm done. Yeah. Wow. So we started working, and it got really hard. And I almost killed myself about four months into it. Oh. It was so hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Kim's pounding on me every day. I'm serious. It took us right. to reconcile. I mean, she forgave me a lot before the 11 years was over, but to reconcile where she trusts me. Yeah. That took 11 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and the last four years of those 11 is she was the one saying, you know, someday would you write something as a gift for our kids mm -hmm. that puts it in one place, how you think? Wow. So she was the genesis for that. Yeah. And, um, and she's also the one that we were in a group of friends who all knew my history. Everybody knew my history. <laughs> now oh, everybody. Yeah. Everybody. <laughs> now the whole world knows my history. It's like, and, uh, and she says in front of me to them, she said, you know, I never thought I'd ever say this, but it was all worth it. Wow. Mm -hmm. And she's not justifying adultery. That's right, the, right, the right, last, right, right. you can't justify adultery. There is no, no justification for it. Mm -hmm. But she is saying, you know, there's nothing so dead that God can't grow something in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's worth it, yeah. you know. So uh, she and I are the best we've ever been. But, yeah. and, but you know what? We lost stuff right. in the process. Yeah. And, um, and here's here's this is really helpful helpful to me I've learned to live with regret as part of grieving and not part of shame mm. oh that's beautiful right? isn't that, that? Beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah and because I feel it yeah people yeah. say well if you could go back and change anything knowing about the shack and the impact that it's had in the world and all that would you do it I go in a second mm -hmm. I go back if I could change one time that I hurt one person yeah I change it, yeah. you know. This is all God's sense of humor and kindness and grace and all that. But yeah, I wish I hadn't. You know. Wasn't there a moment that comes to mind? Because I, you were very kind, a very very kind man. So, do you remember the moment when that switched over? Ah, uh, where I became kind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, where you returned to your kindness. When I, thank you, and yes. I think that's that's a much yes. better way. Yes. So. My friend Baxter Kruger, who's a theologian, who wrote The Shack Revisited, one of his lines that I love, and I've camped there now for a number of years, is wholeness is when the way of your being matches the truth of your being. Oh. I'm telling you. I want to make a t-shirt. You absolutely that. would be welcome to do it. Wholeness is yeah. when yeah. the way of your being how you live yeah. matches the truth of your being. And so part of my journey and, and from my religious history, uh, where we were told that we were just pieces of crap, worthless, depraved, and all that, we were told that that was the truth of our being, mm -hmm. right? So how do you get kindness to match that? It's just all, it's just, you're covering over the fact that no, you're worthless, right? Mm. And then sexual abuse doesn't exactly help. help. And, <laughs> and my dad's fury didn't help. Yeah. And so and at the core, mm -hmm. I, yeah. I was not good and I was not kind. Mm -hmm. So the transition began. Um, I, I, you know, when you, when you think that all you are is a piece of crap, you, you don't listen to your own longings mm -hmm. and yet they're still there. The longing to be kind, the longing to be good, the longing to have self-control, and um, and uh, but at the same time, this this beautiful reframing of who God is, and especially in the person of Jesus, and that we're made in the image and likeness of God, mm -hmm. and that God doesn't become anything that's not good, and He becomes fully human. Mm -hmm. What's this, you know? And um, so, what changed was my the inside eyes opening up to the truth of my being that I am by nature kind right mm -hmm. and yeah. so for me to be unkind is to actually I have to work at it I, <laughs> I have to believe a lie 
about myself or about God or about humanity yeah. in order to be unkind. Right. And um, and if I am, it's because something got triggered, some something. Right. Right. But and mm -hmm. and it becomes backhanded grace, like, mm -hmm. okay, let's figure out where that came from. <laughs> you know, well, you know, why was my my reaction to do that? And it's yeah. it'll be buried somewhere in some something yeah and yeah. I get a chance to do a little more work you know that's, what, that's what we do I know <laughs> I know thank you that's for that we do dig down in dig, dig down dig deep exactly so I love the idea of your um relationship a god a god of relationship and when I first read your book the, the lies we believe about god and I said to Robin, I says, oh, I, it, it's so amazing. And I don't even think I was all done. And she says, tell me what you liked about it. And I said, lie number one, God loves you, but he doesn't like you very much. Yeah. And she went, oh, <laughs> okay. And I says, you know, it's just, it's time to move to a loving being. Yeah. It's time. Yeah, God doesn't need us to perform in order to feel good about himself. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard once, who am I to say that I could push the buttons of the creator of the universe, that the, he has buttons and I have the power to push them and make them uncomfortable? Unless you consider all those buttons to be love and kindness and Correct. goodness. And, Correct. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah. You push those all the time. Yeah. My grandbabies push those all the time. Yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah. They also have a way of finding the other ones too. But yeah. You know. Yeah. But you know what? Here's here's part of the beauty of the process. Yeah. As hard as it is. Yeah. And and don't ever think that it's an easy journey, because it's not. Yeah. But as hard as it is, as you move toward wholeness, your awareness um, of of deviation becomes much sharper. Yeah. So, and your ability to, to recognize it, uh, and and your capacity to learn to laugh laugh at yourself, those kinds of things. Yeah. So, so what used to take me six months to try to work through, uh, I can do in yes. six hours. Yes. And sometimes six minutes. Yeah. You know, and um, um, and, and at the same time, the breadth the the spectrum of your capacity to deal with life emotionally because yeah. the damage just squeezed my life till it was only a s series of muted grays you know mm -hmm. and the colors are given to us in terms of our emotions and yeah. and and the the eruptions of longing and yeah. and really good beautiful stuff um, but that also means that you feel the losses around you mm. to a deeper way and if yeah. you haven't dealt with yeah. being a rescuer yeah. That's going to drive you right back into to destroying your life through service. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's like you know, mm -hmm. I I get to be the child finally, and I think that's the marker yeah. for me. Fifty was a real point where it's like the clock flipped over. Yeah. Fifty is the year I'm turning fifty, right? And I'm, it's my year of jubilee. That, yeah. That's the thought that was at the beginning of the year. And at the beginning of the year, I'm thinking. I am one of the healthiest people that I know, right? Mm -hmm. I have no secrets, yeah. I have no addictions, and not just porn and all the yucky right. ones. I have no addiction to doing something great for God, right? right? Yeah. Gold-chained addictions, right. pleasing my dad, right? right? And right. I'm the same person in every situation. I didn't know that was even possible, yeah. right? Yeah. And, you know, and joy become a constant companion. And, uh -huh. and so I'm looking at my life going like, Finally, I've become a child. I never oh, was a oh, child. Yeah. I never was a child. And now it's like, I'm watching my grandbabies and they're, they're like, yeah, we know how to live inside the grace of one day. Yeah, yeah we, oh. you know, we know how to trust. Yeah. You know, we don't question the fact that we're loved. Yeah. You know, all, all of these things that are part of, we know how to play. Yeah. Yeah. I really sense that in your words that that generates, I, this, there's just a, a generational thing you've begun that's just it has transferred down come on yeah. I received that and my <laughs> my therapist boss um, said to me one day uh, I was leaving Byron and he says Paul a lot of things stopped with you yeah mm -hmm. and I'm going like yeah a lot of things stopped with me yeah mm -hmm. and um, and let the ripple of that yeah. now go you know and yeah. things stopped with my dad too I mean and uh, 
he took it as a big a step away from his history as he knew how. And, um, but that also created some space for me to take a bigger step away. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, we have, you know, we call them chain breakers. And when you broke some change and moved forward, it healed It healed a piece of him. I mean, it, it, yeah. we have spiritual DNA that when that gets worked on, yeah. it affects the generation. Yeah. It really we're, does. We're still working on our testimony. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's changing. It's changing. Yeah. And it's slow and incremental. And not according to any agenda or plan. My, I have totally released my dad from being a father. Mm-hmm. From any expectation to do that. Uh, I remember, uh, he's 89. On his 80th birthday, I go for a walk. I'm um, a little bit in turmoil. And I just feel... Papa God's arm around my shoulder and go, Paul, you know your dad? I go, yeah, I know my dad. He says, he hasn't known how to be a father for 60 years. He's not suddenly going to figure it out. I said, I know that. And then I hear, if it's okay with you, I'll be all that to you and more. Wow. And that that released my dad. Yeah. Right? From from my set of expectations. And, um, and it was also part of my healing journey so that I didn't need to look for a father figure, which had really had gotten me into some jams over yeah. my lifetime. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and placed people in positions that they ought never to have had. Uh, you know, yeah. and um, so, yeah, so we journey. So you're a healer. <laughs> you're a healer. Uh, yeah, you're wounded healer. one. <laughs> hey, we all are. The wound, the wound is how the healing, the healing can't happen without a wound. That's very cruciform, you know. Yeah. And uh, and it is. That's that's true. Um, yeah. Blood and water. I think was it Jeff that says the first thing Jesus does is show you his wounds. Yeah. It's important. The wounds are okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Now that's why I put nail scars on Papa's wrists and nail scars on Sariu, You know, the Holy Spirit as well, because yeah. you. You can't engage one without the three, and you just can't. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. And Paul writes and says, For God was in Christ recon- and reconciled the world to himself, not cutting their sins. Yeah. So again, nail scars. Yeah. And it's um, the way of God's being, and it's the way that we get to participate in a broken world. I mean, there was no suffering within the relationship of God, mm-hmm. you know, until we showed up <laughs> and, and God didn't run from it right I know right. so there's a there's such beauty to that it is mm. it's time it's oh my gosh. it's time and it's happening you know I get to travel around the world and watch the ripple effects of all kinds of things and 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 there is rising up within the human consciousness it, it is um, a demand from within for wholeness mm-hmm. and um and I think that's partly why God has raised up so many healing modalities because yeah. we're so incredibly crafted. Yeah. There's no single fix, you know. Yeah. And so the weaving of a person's soul toward wholeness is, can touch on this and this. You know, AA is obviously a gift from God. Yeah. Yeah. And it's saved millions of people's lives. Yeah. But so are all these other modalities. Right. And, and, um, I'm grateful. Yeah. Human beings are spectacular. And, and really... <laughs> ugly at times too, you know. <laughs> but don't you find that the depth of someone's suffering becomes the depth of their joy and their capacity you can't give what you yeah. don't have and what you haven't yeah. felt yeah. yeah so yes I, I do but wholeness doesn't require tragedy and loss no. you know mm-hmm. and um, and God never will use evil to accomplish good mm-hmm. right but is such a redeeming genius that can climb into the deepest, darkest recesses of human choice, like creating a torture device called a cross. Mm -hmm. And how does God destroy its power? By submitting to it Mm -hmm. and climbing onto it. And not only destroys the power of it, but transforms a torture device into an icon and a monument of grace that is so precious that people wear it on their rings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really genius. So God can climb into what was done to me and then what I perpetrated. Mm -hmm. And through the process of movement toward wholeness, redemption, Mm -hmm. can then change my life into an icon and a monument of grace. Mm -hmm. (sighs) That's too beautiful for words. Yeah. Yeah. That is. 
Well, I feel like um, you were saying that everybody got their own message out of the shack. And for me, it was all about forgiveness, which shows you what I needed to work on in my life. But um, who in your life, what was the hardest point of forgiveness? Was it forgiving your father? Was it forgiving yourself? Forgiving myself. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think that's the hardest journey. Yeah. You know, and um, and there's a difference, but a really significant difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't understand yeah. it. A lot of my people don't understand it. Yeah. Um, people ask me about the book and the movie, because in the movie and the book, you don't see the perpetrator's face. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and they say, why not? And I said, because you don't need a face for forgiveness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people have been hurt by people whose faces they've never seen. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and frankly, a lot of the people that hurt you don't care. Right. Yeah. Right. They don't care. They could be dead. They don't right. care. And if you're waiting for someone to make a different choice about how they look at situation and how what they did to you before you can forgive them, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> the thing about forgiveness is it is absolutely something you can do. Mm-hmm. You know, Jesus when he says, um, "If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you know, yeah. a little tiny seed you can hardly see." You can say to this mountain, but the whole context is forgiveness. This is where Peter says, how many times do I have to forgive someone? And Jesus says infinite, right? 40 times seven, you know, 70, four, 70 seven. times seven. And um, which is a Jewish colloquialism for forever. Yeah. And he goes, that's impossible. Yeah. And, um, and he says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain of unforgiveness, be moved and it'll be thrown and cast into the sea. Yeah. That's different, right? Then, Reconciliation, which requires a face. Yeah. And reconciliation yeah. is the rebuilding of trust. Mm. So you can forgive someone and never trust them again, legitimately. Yeah. True. And see, if you don't know the distinction and you think forgiveness means, well, I've got to feel good about them right. or I've got to trust them, you're going to be in a boundary jam of monumental proportions. <laughs> right? Because there are people who... Uh, they're not trustworthy right. until a number of things have happened. One is that they've owned what they've done, yeah. Yeah. right? They've confessed what they've done, yeah. specifically asked for forgiveness, and then changed over time. And and it's like Kim. Kim had to see all of those things mm-hmm. before there was even the possibility of reconciliation. Yeah. You know, and it took 11 years. Yeah. And then, so I was doing an interview with uh, Maria Shriver, who was also betrayed, mm-hmm. you know, in her marriage. And we were talking about Eve, and um, and we went for a walk, and she said, so does Kim trust you? And I said, absolutely, and she has every reason to. She said, how did you get there? She said, I can't get there. And I said, well, you might be confusing forgiveness with reconciliation, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And just talking about that takes, you know, takes you off the hook in that sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I did not have the right to put a timetable on Kim. I'm the perpetrator. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. I did the betraying. And I had to learn to trust the Holy Spirit in her life and not try to play the Holy Spirit. And um, mm-hmm. so, <sighs> forgiveness. Yeah, and the hardest one was myself. No question. And then the process of healing and wholeness is one of where you reconcile to yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one thing to. Where you trust yourself again. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and but that requires what? I own it. I yeah. confess it. Yeah. Right? Which is part of the work that you do, right? right? And if without truth telling confession, there's no wholeness. Yeah. You know, and and a lot of times you're around somebody if they're not willing to tell the truth, walk away until they are willing to tell the truth. Mm, right. You know, and then uh, you learn to ask for forgiveness or forgive yourself or whatever and then change that's repentance, change over time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she watched all of that. So mm-hmm. she absolutely trusts me. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I trust myself, you know. Yeah. Um, and I'm the same person if I'm in a hotel room by myself or with a crowd of people or with strangers or my grandbabies or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, um, and isn't there a freedom in that? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Compared to the path of lies. I mean, yeah. there's so much... Uh, yeah. The least freedom. to keep track of. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness. You have to keep track of everything. Real freedom feels irresponsible. Wow. Yeah. Well, and rightfully it, so. Isn't yeah. the getting from one to the other seems so scary from this side of the Yes, because 
we know our prisons yeah. and we are so you know the thing about um, abuse and things like that um, is that it pushes us into survival mechanisms that are a drive for certainty we need control yeah. because you have one of two choices when you face fear one is control yeah. and the other is trust yeah. all when trust has been absolutely violated you're going to look for control yeah. so we create our whole systems of control prisons you know yeah. uh, without dealing with them and all we do is we put up a sign that says home you know and then somebody says well you you can come outside and it's like but I know this prison. Right. Yeah. Right. Do you remember how many times Jesus would say to somebody uh, who had, was a cripple or who was epileptic or something, and they'd go, like, he'd go like, so what do you want? Mm -hmm. And it's like, isn't it obvious? No, mm -hmm. it's not obvious. Mm -hmm. It's like, do you want to be whole? Do you want to be healed? Yeah. And you know what? <sighs> when we're afraid, the prisons that we know are far more attractive and promise us without any legitimacy, but promise us the illusion of certainty. Mm -hmm. And whereas freedom is like, well, what do we do with that? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> that's all this space. Yeah. You know, right. when I'm shackled to the wall, I know I, I only have to move two feet. Yeah. yeah, That's it. My whole life is two feet. Yes. You know, so why are you telling me that I, you know, that I, I can be free? Mm -hmm. I don't know. We love our prisons. That's powerful. Yeah, when I... Well, I often say when your walls start to break down, you feel like you're falling through space for a minute and you realize you're just floating. You've just been leaning against a wall for, yeah. you know, you've just been. But it's, you know, you can say that all you want, <laughs> but when you're, when you're talking to the person who's about to step off the cliff, it's oh, like, yeah. oh, for it's sure. like no, I'm going to hit the bottom. Yeah, oh, you know? right, you that's do. what I mean. Yeah. You do. Yeah. The yeah. thing about hitting the bottom is finally you got a place to stand. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And where you didn't ever before. Yeah. Well, before I, I knew anything about you, and then I read your books and everything, and you use the word wholeness all the time. Yeah. Uh, so what does wholeness mean to you? Okay, as I've defined it already, it's when the truth of your being, when the way of your being matches the truth of your being. That's wholeness is when you're an integrated person. Yeah. You know, and uh, yes, we have a mortality, a physical body. Um, we're we're always going to be physical beings. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and um, and it is decaying and things like that. But there is a there is a glory of our humanity that rises up within it and even enlivens this physical mortality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it is uh, the integration of of your whole person, mm -hmm. all the dimensions of that. Yeah. You know, whether it's spirit, soul, and body, or with imagination, emotion, you know, you can, you can yeah. describe it a ton of yeah. different ways. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's a journey, and it's a process, as much as we don't like process. <laughs> don't we all want extreme soul makeover? Yeah. Yeah. Send me to Disney World, fix me by the time we get yes. there. You know, and, um, and it is, uh, it is evidenced when the way of your being matches the truth of your being. So the integration to me is to the image and the nature and the likeness of God. Yeah. So all the lies about God become absolutely essential to un to uncover, uh -huh. um, and all the lies about myself and about yeah. being human it becomes essential. We need to be exposed, yeah. right? Um, the unexposed is the unhealed, mm -hmm. right? And um, and and so. What do I know God to be like? Well, when I thought that he was a kind of a distant omni-being, yeah. you know, um, then being made in the image and likeness of God was like, oh, I can be a distant omni-being. Because <laughs> you know? you know, we, we tend to create the God, we tend to become like the gods we create. You know? yeah. and, um, and so it's like, no. I, I look at Jesus and I see kindness. I see tenderness toward children kindness towards lepers that nobody touches, the outcasts, the, you know, yeah. fury at religion that keeps people from being fully yes. human and fully alive. I got that, you know, <laughs> and yet, and yet at the same time, when he yells, whoa, 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 he's not saying, damn you, he's saying, right. stop, mm -hmm. because you're caught in a web of self-referential incoherence that is destroying your ability to be fully human and fully alive. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the journey is through fire. Um, 
but it's a love it's a fire of love yeah and um, so I can tell you all the things that are true about me I'm kind I'm pure of heart mm-hmm. right I'm good I'm patient I'm long suffering I'm furious at that which hurts the ones I love you know on and on and on creative all the things that are like God and true about God yeah. you know especially because they're revealed right to us in Jesus. Yeah. And I love that you can smile while you say that. I know. know. Me yeah, too. too. <laughs> I know. Well, thank you so much for coming. Oh, I know. Absolutely. I could be here all day. I could listen <laughs> I've got all day tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, absolutely an honor to be with you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for helping us um, move in the direction of wholeness. Because every person you touch changes the cosmos yes you know, every choice to move in the direction of wholeness changes the cosmos yeah. the ripple effect yeah, yeah. Thank you <laughs> thank you for listening join the community of knowledge and growth at the wholenessnetwork.com